Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Welcome you all to our Perseverance uh, family. And as always, we're going to start with Mary. Good start, right? Yes. Yeah. So let's start by inviting Mary to be with us. Uh, prayer that she loves so much is the Hail Mary. We call Mary as our, she's the mother of God. She's the mother of the church. She's our mother too. Thanks to uh, Blessed Herman the Cripple, right? Yes. She's our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Let's turn to our spiritual guide, and that's the Holy Spirit. So that's the Holy Spirit who's known as the gift of gifts. He's also known as the finger of God. He's known as the counselor, the consoler. Sometimes we struggle with our prayer. Good news, Romans chapter 8. And Paul says, we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba, Father. So let's invite the Holy Spirit to be with us, to give us a lot of light, a lot of joy, and the fire of divine love. And we can invite the Holy Spirit through a very humble song that we sing every morning. <clears throat> and it goes like this. Spirit of the living God, Full of fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, full of fresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, Fall afresh on me, now on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, Fill us, use us, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Fall afresh on us. Fall afresh on us. Our Lady Guadalupe. Pray for us. Saint Joseph. Pray for us. Saint Michael. Pray for us. Saint Gabriel. Pray for us. Saint Raphael. Pray for us. Saint Ignatius. Pray for us. Saint Faustina. Pray for us. Saint Ambrose. Pray for us. All God's angels and saints. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hope you all had a very blessed um, weekend and a very holy, blessed, peaceful Sunday. So we're we're back in the midst of our wonderful conversation in which we're talking about many things. We're talking about the saint of the day, we're talking about the catechism, we're talking about Advent. In the very heart of it, we're talking about the, uh, the Word of God. The Word of God, Old Testament and New Testament, all with the purpose of really getting to know Christ better, love Him more ardently, and follow Him more closely. So that being the, uh, the case, uh, where are we going to start where are we going to start today? Father, a word or two on living out this Advent season fruitfully? Yes. One of the last uh, exhortations that I made last week was the importance of silence. Silence is important. Because if we're bombarded by so much noise, it's very difficult to hear the Word of God when we're bombarded by so much noise. Even Pope Benedict XVI, 
when he was giving a talk to a seminarian, says it's difficult for young people to hear the Word of God because we're bombarded by so much noise. So uh, silence is important. Yesterday we had St. John the Baptist. He spent many years in the desert in silence, listening to the Word of God. Another thing that could be um, worthy of uh, practice in Advent would be reading not only by doing our meditation on the Word of God, but maybe taking an hour, maybe an hour and a half, if you're a quick reader or a slow reader, and read the whole prophet Isaiah. As what we do in the liturgy is we kind of chop it into pieces, kind of piecemeal. And read the prophet Isaiah. It's a beautiful, 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 beautiful writing. It's one of the four major prophets, right? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Those are the four major prophets. But he's the, he, he, would, he would be um, probably the most important, very eloquent, using beautiful ideas and words and metaphors and <coughs> allegories and uh, images that are just so uh, inspiring like today. So silence and maybe find an hour in which you can just sit down and read through the prophet Isaiah without interruption, without noise, right? Okay, so there's our uh, a little Advent hint. So what, what, what next? How about a brief idea on the saint yesterday? Yeah, technically when you celebrate... Um, the Sunday in Advent, you're not going to be celebrating the saint, of course. You're not going to have a saint that's going to be eclipsing one of those Sundays in Advent. But um, I felt that the saint that we celebrated yesterday said a lot to me. And the name of the saint was Saint Nicholas, from which we have Santa Claus. And they told about three stories about the life of the saint. And I actually based my, my homily in Spanish on uh, that, uh, that topic. And then one of his hallmarks to sanctity, you might say, is this. He liked to help out people that were poor and those that were really struggling. And one of the most important stories in his life was that there was a man who had three daughters. They wanted to get married. They had no dowry. Because they had to have a dowry. They had to bring some money to the wedding, to the family. So they're reflecting upon the only way they would be able to acquire it to be through prostitution. And this was in the 300s in which... Uh, Women usually did not work outside the house. They were mothers, no? Nicholas heard about this. Guess what he did? On the sly, he drew close to the house where the man and his daughters lived, and he threw a sack of golden coins through the open window. Father saw it up. My daughter can get married. Married without having to give in to sin. Second daughter, had to have a dowry. Father didn't have money. Good old Saint Nick heard about this. He took another sack of golden coins, threw it in through the open window. There it was. One more, one more daughter to go, no? <coughs> Didn't have money. So once again, good old Saint Nick drew close to the window and he threw the money and this time the father wanted to see who is this good Samaritan who is helping to save his daughters from disgrace. 
And the daughter, the, the father ran out of the house and they saw good old Saint Nick scampering away and he stopped and said, thank you very much. Thank you. Now in my, uh, in my homily yesterday, I expounded upon this and the point that I tried to make was that Saint Nicholas prevented sin, prevented these three girls from falling into sin and into disgrace. What about parents today? Your parents are called to be like Saint Nick. If you like, I could change metaphors. You're all called to be like a good shepherd. Good shepherd and your children, your family is a flock, and each child is a sheep in the flock. Are there wolves out there today? My homily was saying there's maybe more wolves than sheep. It's always been the other way around, right? Maybe more wolves than sheep. And I, uh, in my homily, I mentioned three typical scenarios <clears throat> that uh, parents have to deal with today. And I'd like to go through them briefly. Say, for example, you have a teenage daughter, and um, maybe she's 14, 15, and all of her friends have boyfriends. They might even have girlfriends, huh? It's the way the world is today, right? Yes. And your daughter wants to have a, have a courtship, have a, have a boyfriend. She's too young. So you sit down at the table with your husband and say, you're not going to have a boyfriend. A New York expression, all hell breaks loose. She becomes infuriated. Look, you come from another culture. I come from Mexico. I'm living in the United States. Wake up and smell the coffee. You are an archaic fossil of the Middle Ages. No? You're obsolete. No? You have to become more modern. So you and your husband put down your foot and you say, you're not going to have it. So, goes into a room, slams the door, And about a week later, almost with tears in her eyes, she sits down at the table and says, Mom and Dad, you're right. I talk with one of my friends, 15 years old, and she told me in confidence that she just had an abortion. Why? Because her parents allowed her to have a courtship. And her friend's going to have to live with that the rest of her life. And I thank you very much because I have an older sister that's 10 years older than me. She has a college degree. She's practicing her profession. She's married with a professional. They just had their first baby. And the first baby was baptized. And every time I see her, she's really happy. And I really thought I'd like to follow the, the good example of my older, my older sister. Got it? Second example, <clears throat> you got a son that's 10 years old, and he says, for Christmas, I want Santa Claus to come down the chimney in his red pajamas, his white, white beard, his beer belly. Ho, 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 <laughs> and I want him to bring me as a gift, the most modern new cell phone. Yeah. 
Uh, forget about buying me pajamas. I want that, okay? Or buying me a new toothbrush. I don't care about that. No. Or buying me shoe polish. I don't care about that. I want the new phone. And you and your husband say, all this related to St. Nick. And Nick, St. Nick prevented what? Prevented sin. And you and your husband say, look, you're not going to get one. You're too young. But he clamors. But all my friends have one. All my friends have one. Now I'm the only one that doesn't have one. Justice. Justice demands that you give me my phone. And you say, you know, Christmas, that chimney, we're going to lock it up. Good old St. Nick is not going to be coming down that chimney this, this Christmas for you. <clears throat> it's a way of saying you're not going to get it. He goes in his room and he throws a tantrum. A week later, he comes out and says, you know, I thank you because one of my best friends, who's uh, 10 years old, he revealed to me that for the past three years, every day he's looking at pornographic stuff on the phone. So starting at eight, about eight years old, his best friend, and his best friend says, I, I know it's wrong, but I can't, I can't get off it. You know, that's happening. Parents have to be like St. Nick. They have to be willing to put down their foot and say, no. Now, one of the most important words you have to learn how to say, it's a monosyllabic word with two letters, and you spell it N-O? What's that? No. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. You don't, do you okay. know what I'm okay. talking about? Yes, I do. you know what I'm no, talking about? No, I know about? what you're talking about. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. Don't say no. Now and then we just have to say no. No can sometimes be the best expression of love. And as parents, you're not always called to be amigasos or, you know, big buddy, you know. You're called to be parents, good shepherds to your children. You have the moral authority of your children. That comes from the sacrament of matrimony. Too often parents are just like buddies, no? Is that the way it should be? No. no. You have authority over your, yes. over your children and utilize it. Yes. Last example I gave was taken from an excerpt from the life of Padre Pio. Now the first two are parents that are imitating Saint Nick. This third case would be an example of a parent did not imitate Saint Nick. And as a consequence, the child fell into the worst possible scenario. And it's this. <coughs> there was a, happened in Italy, um, a mother with a daughter who's probably in her late teens, very attractive but very, very seductive, and dressed in a provocative way. Very vain and uh, purpose provoking. The mother knew it was wrong. But she never had the moral courage to put her foot down and say, you got to dress better. You're provoking people. They're very displeasing to God. So one day, Padre Pio was in the church in his, um, hearing confessions. And the woman, the mother comes in in tears. Padre Pio came out of the confessional and said, I'm very sorry because your daughter was killed in a car accident. I'm sorry about that. But also, I'm even more sorry that 
your daughter is in hell now because you did not have the moral courage to, to correct her. We can commit a sin through thought or a deed and omission. So the first, first two cases would be the Saint Nick. The third case would be the negligence of being a Saint Nick. The negligence of not having the moral gumption to say no. I know it's a tough topic, but it, it really impressed me when I was meditating yesterday. We meditate upon something that seemed to resonate within us. I think I have to share it. No? I agree. It's important, Father. It's important? It's very important. Very important. So uh, I thought I would just uh, explain that because this, what I'm saying resonates with all of you, if you're moms and dads. You have to love your kids. But St. Thomas Aquinas defines love as willing the good of the other. And the greatest good of another is the salvation of his soul. Would you agree with that? Yes, Father. Nothing more important. Nothing more important. Yeah. Good. So I thought I would just uh, <coughs> tie up that. Okay. Yes, yes. How about the saint of today and his importance? Sure. Saint we celebrate today, I'll show you a picture of him from my saint's cards. I hopefully you'll be able to see this. All right, today we celebrate the memorial of Saint Ambrose. A very interesting saint. He, uh, he lived in these years from the year 340 to 397. He was born in Germany. Um, came from a, a very well-educated family. His father was an army official. And Ambro was highly educated. Now, he was thinking about becoming a Christian. Now back then, sometimes they put off baptism almost until the end of life. It was just uh, their style. You try to live a good life and then you're baptized and then with that baptism, you know, your sins are washed away, you can, you can go upwards, no? I don't think it's very wise because we don't know how long we're going to live, no? No. Uh, death can, comes like a thief in the night. No? Uh, death is the most certain thing but the most uncertain thing. You know? So, uh, with all these talents that he has, he ends up in Milan, which is a huge city in Italy, in northern Italy. Turin and Milan are the two most famous northern cities in Italy, right? So, uh, he becomes governor there. And he's already he's preparing to become <coughs> a Catholic Christian. I don't even have to say Catholic Christian because this was before the Protestant Reformation. So all were Catholics. No? Yes. Not the best of Catholics, but Catholics. So what happens is that <clears throat> he's the governor there, and they're very impressed by his ability. He's very talented, and he's in he's intelligent, but he's He's really, he's got a strong character. He's willing, to, he's willing to fight. If he believes it's the truth, he's not going to back down. You know what happens? Bishop dies. There's no bishop from, from, there's no bishop from Milan. Like also in the case of St. Charles Borromeo, you know. There's no bishop in Milan. This would be 1,100 years later. The people there in Milan loved Ambrose so much, so they cried out, Ambrose for Bishop! Ambrose for Bishop! Ambrose for Bishop! Wasn't even baptized yet. Do you have to be baptized to be a bishop? Of course. 
I think so. It definitely I mean, is. I, you, you threw me <laughs> off when you asked me that uh, question. Okay. I'm going, well, I think so. Yes. Yeah, you have to have. You have to be baptized to be a bishop. Yeah. You can't be a pagan bishop. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you threw me with that one. How about that one? <laughs> we should be ready for my curveballs, right? Yeah. So, you know what happens? They accelerate his baptism. He's made a deacon, made a priest, and he's he made a bishop. Probably the quickest acceleration of all the sacraments of history of the church. No, he had already studied it and knew he, he knew about Catholicism, but um, obviously he had to go deeper. So he is made the bishop of Milan. And as always, the church is always going through tough times. There were a lot of problems that he had to confront. And probably one of the biggest problems he had to confront was a, a heresy called Arianism. Arianism, it, it, it was a heresy that was spreading like wildfire among the Christians. And Arianism is the denial of the divinity of Christ. So you had Christians that followed the Bishop Arius, Arianism. They're denying the divinity of Christ. You know who the modern Arianists are? They're called the Jehovah Witnesses. Whoa. Did you know that most Jehovah Witnesses used to be Catholics? And that's as a result of a lack of education. If they would sit down in our conferences every day, our perseverance class, none of them would become Jehovah Witnesses. Amen? Amen. You agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. So we had fight tooth and nail against Arianism. And there were a couple of emperors, Theodosius, another one that were trying to imposed civil laws which were unjust on the church. And he put it up his dukes and he duked it out. Very strong. There was one emperor that ended up killing thousands of people, innocent people, and Ambrose said, if you don't repent, you're excommunicated. And he knelt down, he knelt down in front of Ambrose begging for forgiveness. I mean, he was a tough, wow. t tough character, yes. wasn't he? Yes, yes. But probably the most important element or detail in the life of this great man is I call it the, the domino effect of sanctity. And it says how one saint <coughs> helps another one to become a saint. And I'll explain. When he was uh, already a pretty well-known, renowned bishop in Milan, very eloquent preacher, a great writer, poet, mystic, wrote songs, uh, loved the Blessed Mother. Uh, someone drifted from Rome to Milan, and he was a famous orator, as was Ambrose. And that was uh, actually Augustine. And Augustine was followed by his mother, whose name, was, whose name was Monica. Now Monica, she would go to Ambrose and apparently talk to him, pouring out her heart about her wayward son. Now her son was never baptized. But her son was reflecting upon the whole idea of Catholicism. Her son was Augustine. And Augustine had read the Bible, and he had read almost all the classics. He rejected the Bible. You know why? Can I tell you? 
He thought the Bible was uh, simplistic for simpletons. Wow. Yeah. Because you're reading someone like Cicero or um, these very florid or um, poetic writers. They used, their language was much more, you might say, grandiloquent, much more, much more developed. And these little stories of of, of uh, the sower, or, or maybe um, it was so simple that because of his pride, he felt that these stories in the Bible was for simpletons. And obviously, it was a trick of the devil. Yes. There's no book that's greater than the Bible, right? So the mother goes and she's talking to him and she's pouring out her tears. This you can read in, in Confessions. And Ambrose says to, to Monica, this is in Confessions of St. Augustine, a woman who has shed so many tears, her son will be converted. She had earlier had a dream of the conversion of her son. So I give her consolation. Blessed are those who weep, they'll be consoled. So, one day, Augustine is in the garden. He hears a voice, totally legit, take and read. He opens up a book there in the garden, and the book happens to be the Bible. Romans 13, 13. Do not give into the provision, provision of the flesh, but put on the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, Augustine's struggle, his basic obstacle, as we spoke about yesterday, we talking about the capital sins, right? Was that of lust. And this was one of his prayers. Give me chastity, but not yet. Not yet. Not yet. A little bit later, no? So when he read that Romans 3, do not give in to the provisions of the flesh, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, he finally was convicted. I know that I have to say no to my own lustful passions. I know that I have to. So he tells his mother, and they go off to, guess who, St. Ambrose. And St. Ambrose baptizes St. Augustine. Beautiful story, right? Beautiful. So it's like a tri triangle of sanctity. Now all of you, you're called to become saints. All of you are called to become saints. Some of you are watching me on Facebook. You're kind of looking over your shoulder and looking at maybe a saint's picture on the wall. No. <laughs> <laughs> no universal called to holiness. All of us are called to become saints. None of us are excluded. So St. Ambrose, the rest of his life, he's, he's, he's battling to keep the church afloat. He's got the Arians, the Vandals, there's just a lot of problems. But Augustine is baptized. You know, and Augustine becomes what? Like him. He becomes a priest, a bishop, and he ends up by being bishop of, I'll give you a hint. Where we went to be a bishop is the name of an animal. Hippo. Hippo, not hippopotamus, but hippo. <laughs> hippo in, um, in Africa. So if it were not for Ambrose, we probably would not have St. Augustine. That's right. And if it were not for St. Monica, we'd never have the connection between Ambrose and St. Augustine. So I think there's a triangle there. Yes. <clears throat> so w w the problems we're going through today in the world, in the church, is this, as the founder of Opus Dei said, the biggest crisis in the world is a lack of saints. Can you name the four Latin fathers of the church? The four Latin fathers of the church. St. Augustine is one. St. Jerome is another. 
Okay, St. Ambro Ambrose is a Latin father, and <clears throat> St. Gregory the Great. So those are the four Latin fathers of the church. Not to be confused with doctors of the church. Fathers of the church come from the patristic age, the early part of the church. Doctors of the church, we have doctors of the church, St. Therese of the Flower is actually a woman doctor of the church. So the father of the church has great knowledge, but also great sanctity. So you can't go wrong in reading the fathers of the church. It's called study of patristics. Patris is Latin for father. Do you know the Eastern fathers of the church? Do you? No, Father. Would you like to know? Yes. St. John Chrysostom? St. Basil? St. Gregory, Gregory of Nyssa? St. Gregory of Nazianzen? St. Athanasius? So those are the Eastern fathers of the church. What do you think? Beautiful. All right, so uh, why, don't we, um, why don't we do this? Mary, if you could uh, read the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and then we'll get into the Gospel of the day. Can we do that? Yes, Father. And maybe tell the number, and we'll read, and we'll comment. 188. The Greek word symbolon mean, meant half of a broken object. <clears throat> For example, a seal presented as a token of recognition. The broken parts were placed together to verify the bearer's identity. The symbol of faith, then, is a sign of recognition and communion between believers. Symbolon also means a gathering, collection, or summary. A symbol of faith is a summary of the principal truths of the faith and therefore serves as the first and fundamental point of reference for catechesis. Beautiful. Beautiful. So we're going through uh, number by number, in no hurry, is we're going through the whole, it's, it's the theological virtue of faith. Faith is being expressed by the creed. Creed, credo, symbol of faith, profession of faith, it's all the same. It's basically the, the essence, <clears throat> the essence of our Catholic faith is expressed in the creed. And as we mentioned the other day, there are various uh, creeds. You have the Apostles' Creed. You have the creed of the Nicene Creed, which is the one we pray at Mass on Sunday. Uh, then we have the Athanasian Creed. We hear the word St. Athanasius. He was instrumental in, um, in the composition of that. And it's the essence of our faith boiled down into, into the key truths of our faith. <clears throat> no. If someone were to ask you, <clears throat> you know, what does the Catholic Church teach? Well, what we'd want is we'd want to maybe give them reference, this reference to the, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. However, if that might be, that might be a, a, a very daunting task to read the Catechism of the Catholic Church if they don't know anything about it. So you might say is uh, make them a copy of one of the creeds, just read through it and say, this is basically what the, teach, the church teaches. Now, if you want to go deeper, and then you might sit down and talk with a priest, talk with a priest or a catechist and, and help you to uh, learn it. And then if you want to become a Catholic, you can go to the RCA program and uh, study it, and you can become a Catholic. So it's really important, I think, that we... Uh, we spend each day, maybe a minute or two, going through the Catechism of the Catholic Church. What do you think? It's important, Father. Okay, um, now, <clears throat> uh, the first reading? Mary's presence. Oh. Mary, <clears throat> if you could discuss with us today Mary's presence in Advent. Great question. Does Mary have an important role in Advent? Yes, Father. Yes. 
And Mary always brings us to Christ, right? Yes, Father. Mary is the quickest, easiest, the most rapid, the shortcut to Christ. It's interesting you ask that question. Because right now, this day, we are very close to one of the most important Marian celebrations, solemnities of the year. And in just about five days, five days, we're going to be celebrating another important Marian liturgical celebration. Your question is very important. So tomorrow we're celebrating the solemnity of the Immaculate Conception. Immaculate Conception. Very important. And we'll be talking about that tomorrow. The Immaculate Conception is one of the four Marian dogmas. You got the Immaculate Conception, you got the perpetual virginity of Mary. You got Mary's divine maternity, and then you have the assumption of Mary into heaven. Those are the four Marian dogmas, Marian truths that we uh, we have to believe. I don't like to say we have to believe. We should want to believe with well, well, with a lot of joy, right? Yes. We, we shouldn't be forced to love Mary. Mary's presence should be just a, a magnetic appeal, right? Yes. So, tomorrow we're going to be celebrating the Immaculate Conception, which happens to be, which happens to be the patroness of our country. She's the patroness of our country. If you ever have the opportunity, because of the pandemic, uh, it's more difficult to travel, but once this pandemic um, is resolved, when God wills, no? <clears throat> to travel to Washington, D.C. is a beautiful, beautiful basilica of the Immaculate Conception, probably the most beautiful church we have in our country. According to many, it's the most beautiful church in our country. In the Immaculate Conception, we'll talk a lot about it tomorrow, is that Mary was conceived without the state of original sin. It's interesting, yesterday we had a, a conference with a couple of our workers, um, excellent workers that are uh, dealing with the social workers that are coming, checking out our church to see that things are, 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 are done well because of the pandemic, no? Yes. And um, it was a very enlightening conversation for me because um, of all my activities, uh, I'm, I'm learning I'm a slow learner, what, 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 ha, what has to be done, what shouldn't be done, with the distance and the mask and this and that. <clears throat> and um, after, after listening to them, and they had one of the, uh, the, so, the workers from the health department come yesterday to kind of check out uh, what's going on in the church. Pretty positive evaluation. But um, how meticulous the health department is on trying to combat the coronavirus. How meticulous. Yes. Is uh, so many so many things that almost uh, w me and Father Craig were almost overwhelmed. Almost almost um, everything has to be documented. Um, constantly you got to be cleaning things. Uh, constantly cleaning your hands, making sure the mask is on. Um, so a, a lot of a lot of health rules which are very important to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. And all of these um, these elements, and also documenting it and making sure the workers are doing the right thing. After I finished listening to that, when I was praying this morning, I was thinking, all of this is done uh, for the purpose of helping our people not to contract this virus, which is good. 
this is my thought. What do we do to prevent ourselves from contracting the moral virus, not a coronavirus, of sin? Very good reflection. So we do all we possibly can to wash our hands constantly, clean doorknobs. Okay. But how, how much do we work on tra trying to prevent the moral evil of sin from entering into our family, to entering into our society, enter into our church, we're entering into our own lives. I think in comparison with, with what they're trying to do on a, on a physical, natural level, which is good, <clears throat> far supersedes, far transcends what we're doing on a supernatural level. That's the reason why I talked about St. Nicholas again. I talked about St. Nicholas again because we have to watch over ourselves physically. But I think that we have to make that parallel, that connection between the importance of our body but also the importance of our soul. What's more important, our body or our soul? Our soul, Father. Much more? Much more important. What did St. Ignatius say to St. Francis Xavier that kind of knocked at the door of his heart, moving him to conversion. What would, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his immortal soul? You say that again? What would it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his immortal soul? So as Vatican II points out, we have to learn how to read the signs of the times. I always try to make connection between natural reality and connected to supernatural reality. It's so almost be, be beyond beyond the the beauty present in nature. There is the the creator of the beauty itself, which is God, right? Yes. So you look at the sun. You look at the sun. This is an example. The sun has two qualities, according to physics: light and heat. That's exactly what God wants to do. He wants to enlighten our minds with the truth and set our hearts on fire for love of Him. So beyond, you look at the sun, beyond the sun is Christ, the light of the world, who sends His Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds and set our hearts on fire. What do you think? Beautiful, <clears throat> beautiful analogy. Perfect. You like it? Perfect. You know what I'd like to do now, Mary? Uh, and uh, Facebook um, family, I would like to just summarize the gospel in my own words. Yes. Could I do that? Perfect. For lack of time, and then I'd like to, I'd like to talk a little bit about it, if I could do that. Yes, please, Father. You're going to see the reading from Isaiah is parallel to it, and Isaiah speaks about basically the reawakening of nature kind of a dead, stultified, uh, stagnant nature, which is being revivified. If you like, um, it's easier for me to understand this than a Californian, because basically California, you say you got four seasons, but eh, well, so many knows. <laughs> it's kind of funny, you, you really don't, but if you've ever been on the East Coast, uh -huh. <laughs> when, when you've got Fall, you call it you, you call it here in California autumn. We call it fall, and the reason being is because fall that's when the leaves fall. Winter, the middle winter in California, two o'clock, it's seventy-five degrees. Big deal, no? Whereas the middle winter on the East Coast, you might get twenty degrees below zero, and you're homebound because of a snow blizzard. Wow. It's not a metaphor, this is a reality. Yes. Spring, sp spring, you have the ice is melting, 
in the middle of April toward May you have these spring flowers. April showers bring May flowers. Yes. And then summer can be burning heat and humidity. So what Isaiah is doing is very beautiful, I invite you to read and meditate upon, is the resurrection of nature. And see the resurrection of nature as the resurrection of Christ. Yes. But also see the resurrection of Christ as our own resurrection. Yes. And <clears throat> what Isaiah is really saying, connecting it with the gospel, is nature can become stagnant, it can be so much paralyzed. Can be somewhat paralyzed. And that's the gospel. The gospel is this Jesus is attracting a lot of people. So he's um, now he's surrounded by the Pharisees, the teachers, the scribes, the experts, the experts of the law. At least they think they are, right? Right. Is that they've been studying the law, they've been studying the Old Testament for many years, a lot of them haven't memorized, and um, they're, they're very critical, very judgmental. So Jesus, they, they come to, to listen to Jesus. I would imagine there are different, different um, dispositions. Some come with goodwill, Others are maybe curious. Others are ready maybe to criticize. And others are ready to condemn. So Jesus is surrounded by this, uh, this elite group of individuals, as well as, as well as other people who don't have the same education. And He's, in a, he's in, a, in, a, in a house. Some say it could have been in the house of Peter and Capernaum. And there's a, a man, a paralyzed man, being transported to where Jesus is. Probably have, you have either two men or maybe four men, depending if the guy was heavy or not, right? Yes. So they arrive at the house where Jesus is at. And there's so many people. You know, there's no social distancing back then, right? No. No problem with the, with the virus, no? No. Even if there were, Jesus would be able to purify the environment by his presence, right? That's right, he would. What do you think? <laughs> and he would. So it's so jam-packed. Kind of like a can of sardines, no? They can't get in. Now, a lot of people, if they couldn't get into such an environment, they would shrug their shoulders and say, shucks, well, maybe come back tomorrow. Can't get in? Can't get in. That's reality, right? But these men, who really loved their friend who was a paralytic, they had great compassion on him. They wanted to get in. Maybe they had traveled a long way. Maybe they had blisters on their hands. Imagine carrying a mat. Maybe this guy was 150 pounds, maybe 200 pounds. You're carrying him for maybe a couple of miles. Uh, you could get a blister, maybe even a bleeding blister, huh? Yes. So they're not going to, they're not going to throw in the towel right away, are they? No. So they can't get in the front door. This is one of the passages that I, I find almost somewhat comical. So they decide that they're going to go up on the top of the roof. Now how they do this, um, obviously they're not going to flip them up like a waffle. <laughs> like, like, like a pancake, no? No. It's not going to work, is no. it? No. That means that there must, there must have been 
a ladder, right? Yes. There was no elevator back then. No. no. So there must have been a ladder, a sturdy ladder, and there they have, they're, they're jostling, jockeying this guy up. Maybe he fell off, who knows, no? <laughs> so not only, probably maybe had a bruise or two more, right? Yes. But eventually they, get, they make it to the top of the roof. <clears throat> it's a thatch roof. And what they do is they have to open up the roof, uh, basically destroying a good part of the roof, probably. And then they start to lower the man down. Kind of like a pulley, lowering mm -hmm. him down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see this somewhat comical because with the thatch roof, with the hay and the dirt and the cl clouds of dirt, were probably falling on the heads of everyone, even on Jesus, right? Yes. No? Probably have to take a shower after that, yes. don't you think? No? Now, Jesus doesn't complain. And as he sees the man being lowered down, he looks up. And the first thing he says is, your sins are forgiven you. Now, what do you think the scribes, the Pharisees, the experts of the law? The Gospel says, Jesus read their thoughts. So they didn't even say anything, but he's reading their thoughts. Because Jesus can read our minds. And he says to these who are condemning Christ because they're thinking that he's, he's committing blasphemy because only God can forgive sins and they don't recognize that he, he is God. He is God and he can forgive sins. He forgave sins back then, he forgives sins even now. Yes. Through the ministry of the priesthood, through confession, right? Praise God. So Jesus says, why are you harboring bad thoughts in your mind? What is easier, to say to this man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and go home. But to prove to you that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins, he commands the man, get up, take your mat and go home. And this paralyzed guy gets up and he walks right out the door. Incredible miracle, isn't it? Yes, Father. How do we apply this to our lives? That paralytic is Father Broom, and that's you. We all suffer from moral, spiritual paralysis. We all have within our hearts, going to Isaiah, a stagnant, stultified, dead branches within our souls. Still we have the autumn. We're called to arrive at spring. We're called to leave, John the Baptist says, to clear the way. Clear the way so that Christ can be born in our hearts. That's the message. See the parallel there? Yes, Father. Beautiful message. So, Mary, I think it's a good idea. We're, we're working on a novena, aren't we? Yes, we are, Father. So yeah. we are the fifth day, right? Yes. <laughs> so we're going to say we're, we're making our novena to Lady Guadalupe, if you could follow me. Fifth day. O Virgin of Guadalupe, you want to remain with us through your admirable image. You who are our mother, our health, and our life. Placing ourselves beneath your maternal gaze, and having recourse to you in all our necessities, we need do nothing more. Daily prayer. O Most Holy Mother, I beg you to obtain for me pardon for all my sins, like the paralytic, right? Yes. Abundant grace is to serve your Son more faithfully from now on, and lastly, the grace to praise Him with you forever in heaven. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us <coughs> now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Through the intercession 
of St. Ambrose, St. Nicholas, and Mary Most Holy. May God bless you in a very special way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.